All right, what's up, fellas? Sorry, I'm late. That's one of the things I'm not about, so I apologize for that. So one of the things I like to talk about is generational change because actually coming down here, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll tell you guys about me being a coal miner. Like, this is like home. I look through here. I see what's going on. I actually am from an area literally just like this. So I come here, and I'm like, man, this is wild. It's wild. Cole's the same. He's from down that same area, too. So you guys are in an unbelievable spot. There's blue collar all over it, right? So if you can embody that, and what I'm going to tell you is how I was able to embody that, but also then apply it to something I love, which is how I got here. So my whole, my whole vibe from where I'm from was generational change. And in my world, I'm in the fitness world, that's my goat. That's Arnold, right? So I don't know if that's whoever that would be for you guys individually in the baseball world, but that's my guy. You like you look up, everybody knows Arnold, even you guys do, my grandma does. He's just one of them type dudes, right? So when I got a chance to be around him, I got to see what elite elite really is. And so some of these things that I learned from being around and working with Arnold, I'm able to like kind of put in some of these talks and help you guys. Next slide, cool. So who is Corey G? So I'm a fourth generation coal miner and lifter that wanted something different for my family. And I wanted to make sure when I was done with this life, my, my family would never be the same. So that's the tattoo right there, fourth generation. He was the first lifter in my family. I actually have part of his barbell sets my chalk bowl in my gym from the late 1800s. He also died in a coal mine explosion in 1935 with his brother when my grandfather was nine. My grandfather's the one who taught me how to lift weights. So it's not just, oh, I'm a personal trainer. This is like lineage of hard work lifting weights combined with coal mining that I got a chance to experience, but then didn't carry on. I was able to do what I love. Next. So I always had this concept, you, you know, don't pay attention to them bricks right there, but I'm just saying like, <laughs> but the thing is, is like, I always wanted to be the one. So what's the one really mean? It means that you're gonna take on a lifelong task to change fucking everything. Like that's me. I knew that I was going to do what was required all the time for as long as it took to change it. So once I'm done with it, there's a different way you talk about my family, as we'll see and I'll explain. But that was like the thing I thought about when I was like 15 living in that trailer. I'm like, this shit ain't for me. I don't belong here. I'm meant to do big things. So what do I have to do to be the one? And that's what you guys need to think. Like what is required for you to be that type of outlier? I never even got recruited to play like community college. You guys are so much better athletes than me. I guarantee there's probably at least 25 people on this campus right now that's probably more jacked too, maybe more. But the reality is that part's what I got. That doesn't go out, it's different. Next. So two things that really uh, shaped me were the trailer I, I lived in and the coal mine, like I said, from an area just like this. And those two things really made me a monster. And these are some of the experiences I'm gonna shape, uh, share with you guys. So I worked in a coal mine for only a total of six months, but that was all I needed to learn what was really necessary to be successful in my next opp opportunity in life. Now, when I say I only worked for six months, my best paycheck was 93 hours in one week. Now, most people in the real world get a paycheck every two weeks, but back then they said you can work as many hours as you can physically handle, and I'm like, I didn't say this, I bet, like I'm in, like get it, let me, Mike, let me get the paycheck like overtime. I was getting 50 hours of overtime on a one week pay. So all I had time was to do was lift weights and go to work and sleep a little bit, that's it. And so I know that if I could get in there and save enough money, next slide, well I'll give you what it looks like. You guys are from, maybe not a lot of you guys are actually from this area, but this is what it looks like in a coal mine. And I talked about this when I was with coach before, like one of my jobs was working on a belt line. So the belt line is probably from like this black part of the floor to the wall. And so it's go there's eight miles of belt line underground and we're 600 feet underground. And sometimes I had to ride eight miles into my job. It would take 45 minutes to ride underground to where I would work. And then they give you a shovel and they take your bucket, 
This is my actual lunch bucket from back then. And they'd set it up like six hours ahead of you. And I would be on my knees shoveling on this belt line where my back is rubbing the fucking ceiling. And I'm just like this thinking, hopefully one day I can be a personal trainer and not do this shit. But I signed up for that because that was my only way out, literally. Next slide. And so this is what it looks like on the section. So literally these guys is on their knees. These are the roof supports. And that's just the reality of what my life was literally for six months at the most intense level as I could pull off, like physically. And so I've created two kind of books off of some of these mindsets. One isn't done yet, this pack of lunch, which I'm going to explain to you. And one that I brought to you guys, which will launch here pretty soon, which is I bought an island and wrote a book, which if you guys looked online, I did actually buy an island. And I'll, I'll tell you guys about that in a second. But the pack and lunch mentality. Next slide. So this is my stepdad, Randy, who got me the job in the coal mine. This is actually us on Muscle Island when I was working on it. And one day I was getting ready to go to work because he worked in the same mine. And he's like a dude who does, he lifts weights. Like I'd watch him work a 15 hour shift, come home, still bench 300 pounds with his feet in the air, just super strong dude. Didn't smoke, drink, cuss, like super straight lace. But he's a pretty bad dude. He'd been underground 40 years. And he was talking about how this guy was messing with him. And he was like, look, if this dude keeps talking, I'm gonna put him in the dirt. He better pack a lunch. And I was like, I never really heard him talk like that. Like he was about to put in work at, 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 at work if the dude didn't shut up. And so I started thinking about it what he was telling me is that he's not going to run out of gas, that he's going to do exactly what's required to basically handle that business. And I started kind of taking that approach to work or things I'm working on that way. So this is the way that I kind of unpack that situation. W what position do you play? Pitcher. Okay. Give me a position guy because there's a, like, 10 pitchers. Like, shortstop. shortstop. There you go. All right. So I'm behind you as your shortstop. You're the starter, right? So I'm bringing this every day. Make sure you do what you need to do because I'm right here and I'm packing this thing and I'm pushing you to be the best shortstop you can be as a teammate. But if you fucking slip, I'm taking your spot and I'm still packing this and you got to come get it from me. This is the way I look at everything. Somebody wants this spot right now, but I ain't giving it to them. And you know why? My alarm clock went off at 320 today to be at the gym by four. And yesterday it went off at 320 and 10 fucking years ago it went off at 320. You see what I'm saying? Because I'm packing this every day. Come fucking get it. That, that's the way you got to look at it. I wore the jewelry because I know baseball guys like gold. Like every time I wear around the pro guys, they're always like, oh, I see the fucking presidential. Like that's what it is. So you have to take that. Like you're going to be a teammate and pack the lunch. You're going to put in the work that's required to make that person better. But if they slip and you get your opportunity, you take it and then you don't give it back. And that's the way that I look at my position, my spot, my job, my work, all of it. I don't want to be just good in my profession in Columbus. I want to be a leader in my industry. People pay us and do my workouts all over the world, up to 50 different countries that are on the app. We sold the old company. I sold supplements all over the planet. Like, it's not about right here. It's about how can you pack it to be great in the whole thing. Whatever, if you go pro in ball or just pro in your passion outside of ball. You know what I'm saying? That's the way you got to think about it. Next. So I identify my opportunity. Getting a job in the coal mine, saving my money to move away to go to Columbus State Community College. I wasn't going to Marshall University. You know, I live in the town Denison University. in a great school, D3 school, like a Harvard type thing. Wasn't going there. I was this sparkling opportunity to go to maybe one year of college so I could live with my friends that actually went to Ohio State for one year to maybe get an exercise specialist degree so I could see if I could be a personal trainer. Now, mind you guys, this picture is in 1999. I was 20 years old when I started my business. When I say gym, that's a stretch. That's a hallway closet of a mini mall in Reynoldsburg, coach, that I rented and I started my business. I had like 12 clients. There, it was like 900 square foot for six, but I was 20 years old and I had my own. So 1999, my last paycheck was in 1998 from AEP who owned the coal mine. I have worked for myself 100% in this field for 20, now six, 25 years. 
as a, tr as a fitness guy, whatever. It's looked a little different, but this is where it started. But I had to identify my opportunity and it wasn't sparkling is my point. So look at what your opportunity is. This place is unbelievable. I walked in, are you kidding me? This beats everything I saw that coach had before. And I was right down the street from me, a little closer. <laughs> but the reality is, you, this might be normal, but I need to tell you guys it's abnormal. And you need to treat it that way. You need to understand it that way. Next. So, willing to do what's needed to pack the lunch because someone wants your spot, which I already went through. And this isn't something that I want to be a motivational speech for today. I want this to be a mentality. Uh, I was really thankful I spoke to Dennison because I'm friends with Coach Deegan. He's a really well-respected coach um, in, in Granville where I live. And they used the pack of lunch as their whole mantra for the year last year because they, they, they just kind of embodied that. And they made a really good run in the playoffs and did really well. And it was cool for me to see these guys hashtagging this and doing these types of things last year. It was, really, it was really cool. It's really just a mentality of every day when you hit snooze, which, by the way, is the laziest fucking thing ever created. Don't just don't even do it. You're just asking, oh, I'll just be lazy for 10 more. Well, I'm not hitting snooze. And you got to think the person on the other team that's trying to beat you in all conference, all American, whatever the hell credential you guys are looking for or going to get drafted, they probably ain't hitting snooze either. Now, here's the thing. If you got somebody that's just clearly more talented, and that will happen, I could outwork so many guys, and they still might beat me, but I'm okay if I gave everything I had and I just got beat because they were more talented, but guess what? I outlast them. So that talent, eventually, if they ain't doing the work, they're gonna fizzle out, and I still got the spot, or I'll take it then. That's kind of the, the mentality, all right? Next. Trying to look, this is actually a picture after my first powerlifting meet, I weighed 167 pounds. Um, I was uh, 17 years old in high school. That's in my trailer, super proud. This is the first time I knew this was a sport. Not a sport like you guys, you don't really get paid for this. So you got like bowling trophies and shit. But I could compete in it and I could have a date on the calendar. See what a lot of people don't realize, I think one of the special things that I've had my entire career is that I told you guys about getting up early. I have a crew of guys at 4 a.m. that's been working out together for like 15 years. Every one of these guys that are with me, that's how I met them. Trayvon, who's running the camera, 550 puller at 148. Not bad. Tyler, how much is your ba best back squat? 550? Cole? There you go. So that's what I'm saying. And these guys just coming, you know, outside of like, they was like in college or learning stuff and coming in. So my point is like the habits of this like next level shit that you put in place will, is what kind of keeps that train moving to where people can't touch it. Now, Whenever things don't go right, I gotta look more inward than outward. So, somebody botches a ball or a sign, it's not coach's fault, it's not the next guy's fault. I always say like, if my business isn't going right, what can I do better? Because if you always are projecting the outside and you're not looking inward, you're not getting any better. Because then it's someone else's fault. If this speech doesn't go right today, it's because I was 30 short on indoor, which I got to send down. We are 15 minutes late. That's looking inward. That's not okay with me. Like, that's a fucking problem today for me. And I've talked to everybody about it, of why that happened. Like, it's not an outward thing. Oh, I, got, I legitly got held up by the ammo store on the fucking bridge over there for like 15 minutes. I don't even know what they were doing. But that was the reason why I wasn't here at 3 o'clock. But I didn't give myself enough time. Look inward. See my point? that if you look there first, why aren't you starting? You think it's because your position coach or coach Bills doesn't like you? Or do you think it's maybe because you didn't do enough work this offseason? You see what I'm saying? Like do that first before you blame someone else. Next, actually go back to that real quick, Cole. What habits do I need to acquire? What change do I need to not continue that trend? That's which, when you look in inward, I think to myself, what do I have to study intentionally? So here's the thing is, I was a really bad student, but I've studied since I left high school because I had to teach myself all this stuff, right? There's no internet when I graduated in 97. Like, I had to go and research it and be around mentors. And so I'm always saying, what habits or what needs to change so I can get to the next level? All right, next. So, 
This is when I was, I spent a whole day with Tiger Woods in my old business. I got a chance to actually have lunch with them, go over diet stuff with them, hang out on the range. Once again, I interviewed and started working with Arnold a month before I met Tiger. And Tiger's obviously another goat level type of guy. But the reality was I had already been in front of like my ultimate kind of like mentor. So when I got the Tiger, I was able to just pretty be pretty chill and talk about stuff. The guy's a straight meathead. Wanted to know about supplements, training, protocols. Like it was wild. It was awesome. But here's the difference. When you're around guys like this, the expectation is so different. And I would argue that you guys have to level up your expectation of yourself. If you want to really get a chance to be great, I've seen what greatness, how they operate. Because I've been in this proximity for a whole day. Like uh, Coach Tom Ryan, who's from Ohio State, the wrestling coach, he said to me one time, Corey, would I know what your goals are if I followed you around for a day? And my answer is 100% you would know. But you have to ask yourself, would I, would I know your guys' goal if I followed you around for a whole day? And you couldn't talk to me. I just followed you around. That's where, that's the level of the expectation has to be different. The consistency has to be different. I have had so many, Cole's seen so many talented guys come in the gym that are better than us but I beat them almost every time because of consistency. Consistency is the absolute cure to a bunch of stuff. It's so simple, but so hard for people to execute. And therefore, if you have a crazy expectation and you stack it with real consistency, your results will be completely different. Next. So this is uh, at the 405 front squat that we were doing a little while ago, but back to the consistency. Consistency is a superpower available to everyone. It's the easiest thing to understand, and it's the hardest thing to execute. And for me, and for most, it's literally the ultimate separator. So I look at it like this. When somebody comes in and they uh, want to train against us or compete against us or whatever, I watch them miss Tuesday. They're pretty, pretty talented. Then Three Tuesdays later, I'll watch him miss it. I know I got him because I just know I'm committed to be there. And I would argue the same thing. Like, think about this. Any of you guys want to be in fitness, you're coming against me. That's what I'm thinking. And I done already made plenty of money and got all the cool stuff. And I'm still this way. But that's what elite level performers in any aspects are because the expectation is completely different. And my consistency is what I lean on because I'm not that talented. I wanted to be recruited to play sports. I thought that was the way out of the trailer, but it wasn't. I had to go make this way. I had to go pro in something different. Thanks. So here's the other thing is, these are some of the covers I did back in the day. Nothing is guaranteed, time frame or outcome. So you have to work like you think it's gonna happen or like you need an opportunity. But I can guarantee one thing though, If you never go all in, it will never fucking happen. So I'm working every day with this relentless kind of pursuit. So when the lights are turned on me, I have an opportunity to be great. But if you never work like that, you're not guaranteed that light's ever going to shine on you. But when it's you're up to the plate, you got to make the play. All of that work is so you get an opportunity at it. The problem is you're not guaranteed that opportunity is going to come. But what I do know is if you put that work in, I call them Nerf hoop alley-oops. Everybody wants those. Oh, I got this. Because I've been prepared. That's what you want. So you're up to bat, and you're like, I know this dude's going to throw this, this, and this. I've done my homework. Lock in. I'll get dude in for a second. Like, just automatic. Like, that's how it has to be. Next. So origin story. I bought an island and wrote a book. The funny thing is, the book that I gave you guys really isn't about the island. It's about the mentality that it takes to even get to that part. And I didn't go to college really, so like I wouldn't write a huge book. You guys can all read this in 45 minutes, so it'll be good. You can refer back to it. Um, But I wanna share some of the mentalities and some of the things I thought about, and I'll give you a little bit of background. So um, I'll tell the story of the island here in a second, but I got up two weeks after I bought this property on Buckeye Lake, which is on the east side of Columbus. It's an uninhabited island that's been sitting there since 1866 when they created the lake. No utilities, no one's ever touched it. An acre and a half, gotta get there only by boat, and it was like a jungle. 
Two weeks into it, I've never developed anything. I've never built my own house. I've never, sure, ran utilities under the water or done any of that type of stuff, right? I had this idea to write this book. And it literally just flow state came to me. I recorded it. I sent the idea to Cole. He made this graphic probably in less than an hour. Uh, Danny, who's not here, which we call him Small Arms Danny, he edited it. That's one of our guys on the website. And we had this book. Next. So go to page 72, I believe it is. 73. So there's key takeaways that I want to like really hammer home on this in this book. And these are things that you guys could go back through and read. Um, nothing is going to be perfect. You just have to start. See, this was far from perfect. Actually, this was on its best day because uh, I was in a barter network then and I had a guy trade me personal training sessions for carpet for the gym because I couldn't afford it. Somebody gave me this fucking treadmill and these dumbbells and Irene gave me, one of my first clients gave me the, the dumbbell rack. Like nothing's going to be perfect. Stop being concerned with being perfect. Be concerned with being consistent because there's always, you guys are looking at, okay, version one of this business for me, but version 25 of what I've been doing, right? I'm here because I want to get a rep in front of you guys, get, get, get used to talking, doing this type of stuff because I like it. So it's like, I know it's not going to be perfect, but it doesn't exist. So anybody that's overthinking the process that's in my world, I'm going to beat them because I just start because I don't care what people think. I'm just authentically me. I'm just rocking and I'll figure it out along the way. Perfection doesn't exist, but consistent winners do. When people fuck with me, they know they're going to win because they know what, the what I'm going to put in. They know I'm going to try things. They know I'm going to fail, but is it really failure? I don't even, it's like you're just learning, right? I don't care if somebody on social media doesn't think a certain thing or somebody's aunt or uncle don't believe in it. They don't know what I'm willing to do. No one really knows what you're willing to do. That's the key. They can tell you, they can put their own insecurities on you. Well, what if it doesn't work? Well, what if it does work? What if I could be partners with Arnold Schwarzenegger one day, hang out with Tiger Woods, sell millions of dollars of products? What happens if that works? You see what I'm saying? All right, next slide. And this will be point number two. Authenticity is the cheat code. Now, I'm gonna break down what you're about to see here. And we just, this is like us adding, because I, I, the first time I did, I didn't have the video. So every time I lean into, I'll tell Cole to hit that in a second, more and more of who I am, it, it goes better and better. Because at the end of the day, people want to know, like, and trust you. They want to know that the person that they're dealing with is real. Now, this is a multi-ply power lifting meet. The Kangol that I'm wearing, I wore pretty much every day. I didn't wear one today. But, uh, I mean, my Italian relatives wore that shit growing up. I wore it to my prom. It's just normal. I worked out at this super hardcore gym. I was one of the only guys that didn't take drugs, um, been lifetime clean, but called Westside Barbell that every strength coach in the world has heard of and is the, one of the most famous powerlifting gyms on the planet. Um, Louis, the founder of it, uh, competed for 50 years, just passed away. But this was, a, a, <laughs> I was pushing myself to see if I could do a bodybuilding show and a powerlifting meet in the same weekend. So the day before this, I competed in Akron in a bodybuilding show and I got like fourth place, so not great, but I did okay. And then the next day, I attempted this squat, which Cole is my knee wrapper, 694 at 181 in the 40 to 44 year old division for the world record of drug tested weight class. Now, you'll watch this and I thought I got the record and then I'll tell you after, hit it. Oh, we got an ad. We just added this in the presentation, so we were unaware of that. There we go. So that's authentically me. 
<laughs> and I thought I was the world record holder and we read a kilo chart that was rounded up. It's at 695. It comes out a month later on the charts for like all time. And the guy squatted 694 also and he weighed a pound less than me. So I'm still second. <laughs> so my point is, I'm like a six, ultimate six man. Even when I think I'm first, I'm still fucking second. But I'm really proud of that because that was, uh, I'm 46 now, so I was when I was 44. Um, so it was about two years ago. And being able to push myself to be able to be lean enough to do it, like I'm kind of orange because I still have the tanner on from the, from the bodybuilding show the night, the night before. Um, next point. Uh, so... Don't go to your deathbed with regrets. This is a pretty cool thing for me because I grew up with a bunch of shitty cars and uh, just a whole situation like that. But uh, when you own a Rolls Royce, they have an app that's just for owners. So it's like it's called the Whispers app. I didn't name it, but that's what it is. And they actually did a story on me on the app for Rolls Royce owners worldwide. And so I pulled my Rolls, which I sold when I bought the island, but I'm going to buy another one. But the, I had it for like four years. It was my daily driver, super cool. I pulled it into the gym, which you can see is like super hardcore. That's old school gym, the gym I own. And I took a picture on it. You'll never see this on Instagram. That's not, that's not my jam. I'm doing it and brought it and put it here because I think the story is relevant to your age group to just like, I know you guys like seeing the flashy stuff and I like having it, but that's not what I'm standing on. I'm standing on work. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I just knew that I had so many issues with my cars and my family and all that money shit growing up that my ass would dream of what happens if, my, if I'm a daily as a rolls, that I'm rolling around in sweatpants in my town and this is what it is and that's what it was. And so I just really want you guys, I would rather you to try and fail and take calculated risks so you can get an opportunity to live the way that you want than worry about what other people was thinking of you. Because their name, ain't, their name ain't on your electric bill. Their, their name ain't on your degree. It doesn't matter. I could give two fucks, honestly. Because I'm just living my life. Now, the people that fuck with me really like me. Because I think I offer value. And if they don't, they can do this. And come get it. I'm cool with that. Next. The sauce is in the change around you. This is Jake Owen, country music star that I help out. When he comes through Columbus, he always comes to old school and trains. So any of you guys listen to country music, I know he's had a few big songs. He's an awesome guy. What you don't realize, or you might if you're a leader on this team, when you display it, it's actually about the other people. Because I know what I'm willing to do. And so when your intentions, your disciplines, your consistency is different, it affects other people. That's what a leader is. Uh, Nate Ebner, who played at Ohio State, who uh, was a rugby guy and got drafted by the Patriots and played 10 years. And he just told me, like, first people in the door, last people out, it's Belichick and Brady. Like, he played with them for 10 years. He saw exactly what the greatness looks like. Like, and when you are outliers like that and you are setting the tone, people are either going to adapt and be that way or they're going to fall. In my team... I want guys that want to be different. And so you, I've wore out a bunch of people, but the ones that are sta have stayed, we've been together now seven, eight years building some serious businesses. Next. Don't quit living. Live life younger and longer. Be curious. Keep challenging yourself. You are young now, but I try to like, this is me on vacation playing U ball against all my younger nephews and nieces just trying to dunk on their head, eight foot rim, not caring, like having fun. Part of what I do is fitness, part of what I do is lifestyle, but here's what happens is, I see a lot of guys, they don't go play ball in the league. They're in that transition and they don't have a team anymore. Don't quit doing this. Don't quit being around the homies, pushing yourself in a different way. Like, you can't quit living because maybe this part could be potentially over. You have to find what the next part is that still keeps play part of it. A lot of people, they just dead walking. They are just dead walking. That is not me. Not on all levels. And I refuse to be that way. So please just hear that. Next, I think I might be it. Oh, refine a consistent process, number six. So this is when I was at Arnold's house for Christmas. He literally had a real alligator. 
there and he's saying to me, why don't you kiss it? They, they feed it so much that it's like over full and it don't do anything, but it's chilling. And uh, I think that the key thing that Arnold would teach me all the time is that this right here, the aimless wanderer, you, you have to know where you're going. I would love, like, you guys should each have the goals for the team and for yourself. And you should look at them every day. It's not hokey. Write it down. Journal, mead notebook, whatever, vision board, however you want to do it. I use my phone background. My phone background has my goals on it. It has a quote that I like, and it has my goals on it. And I look at it every day when I get up. So, like, short and long term. And here's the thing is, create the process and refine it. Add, subtract. What makes me elite here? Do I have to be here 15 minutes early? Do I need to run an extra mile? Should I do extra arm care? What makes me different? All right, next call. Discipline is rewarded. Number seven. This is, oh, fuck, that was like in July at Men's Health. I've been trying to get with Men's Health for years. When magazines was cool. I was able to do a whole thing. It comes out the first of the year called Dad Bod Shred. You guys don't need that yet, but... Uh, so discipline is rewarded. I'm really always trying to tell people like address your daily successful habits, your physical training in your programs, your mental training and your curious learning. See that part right there. Although I have no degree or no formal training, really that part is intentional every day. So I go to the gym, I get up at 320. I'm there by four train for, you know, roughly an hour. And then I do some type of conditioning. Today I lunge 400 meters at the track. Sometimes it's 800, sometimes it's walking on the treadmill, whatever. But what am I curious about in that moment trying to get better at? Is it financial IQ, which was a huge thing for me because my family didn't have that. We lived in a trailer. I never heard the word stock. No one ever had any money. Money don't grow on trees, that whole vibe, right? So for years, when I'm doing my conditioning, I'm listening to Robert Kiyosaki. I'm listening to old Andrew Carnegie stuff. I'm trying to learn how to be wealthy. How do I create assets, not liabilities? Like I'm teaching myself intentionally. So whatever you need to get better at right now, when you have a moment of time, pinpoint that. There's a lot of entertainment and distraction going on right now. I want to fucking win. I don't need entertained or distracted. I need to learn. I need to execute. I need to be consistent. And I want to win. And so if you take that mentality when you got the extra time, I should be watching this guy or that guy that pitches like I do or plays like I do or things I can pick up on, right? Um, in consistent, like in boring wins. But I got to tell you, I'm a fucking winner. Winner ain't bo winning ain't boring. The consistent grind, shit don't want people to want to get up. They don't want to drink on fucking Wednesday, Thursday, whatever. I'm cool with all that because I know I'm going to be ready and I'm going to give myself the best opportunity to win. Next two stories left I want to share with you guys and then we can take any questions if you guys so uh, go to the next one Cole so this is the best day of my career met with the most important day so um, the Arnold Schwarzenegger story I was on a golf course in Phoenix and one of the investors I was working with said our, our business at Muscle Farm was doing uh, about 70 million at the time we were selling in like 30 countries 20,000 doors GNC all that stuff and he said, do you think you guys would want to pitch Arnold Schwarzenegger to be your business partner? We're like, of course. Like, that would be amazing, right? So Tom Arnold, the actor, was our connection to it. Some of you older guys probably know who that is. And we got the meeting set up. Well, when you go to California to go to Arnold's office, it's like a museum. So think about whatever baseball legend. It's every one of his trophies. He's got pictures with every president. I walk by in the Conan the Barbarian swords in the corner. Like, ridiculous stuff. Like, unbelievable. There's a mural of him, like, shooting a machine gun from Terminator on the wall when I go to the elevator. So I go up. He don't even look real. It's like when guys talk about Michael Jordan or maybe Tiger if they're golfers. Like an aura. They're like, shit, right? So we're in this meeting, and his ass comes in there and sits down and says, well, I wouldn't even do this with GNC. I wouldn't do it with this. Why would I do it with you guys? And we're like the hottest thing at that point in time. This is like 2011 or so. We're like almost like the Nike of the space. Our vibe actually kind of looks similar like colorway to you guys. We're a sponsor in the UFC. We got all this big stuff going on. And so he had just come off being governor. And so he wasn't really in the finish realm a whole bunch. And so I said, Arnold, I just had a 
um, a video series that I did with my workouts that had 28 million page views on bodybuilding.com and selling a lot of product. I think if I had access to the pumping iron footage and we remade it and did new voiceovers and got people off their phones, back to training and like bring back, I knew he owned the pumping iron footage. For you guys that don't know, that's like the most legendary bodybuilding movie of all time and he owns it. So if I had access to that footage and I could do with my skill set, I thought I could make it ridiculous. So he was like, okay. So he watches, he literally grabs the laptop, he watches the video of me. So I'm in Arnold's office. He's watching a video of me lifting, and there's about six, eight of us in the meeting, and I didn't even think. I had just shot this cover two months before. I did an eight-hour photo shoot for this magazine. Now, mind you, this is a while ago. My son's a sophomore in college now <laughs> at Ohio State in business. This has been a minute. But the reality is this was the, one of the coolest things I've ever done in my whole life. I did an eight-hour photo shoot. My kids jumped in at the end for like 10 pictures. And they called me and said, we're going to use this. This was on every newsstand when I flew there. And I walked by. There's people in New York, like policemen reading it. I walked by like, hey, man, that, that's a great cover. Like, I'd be fucking with people, right? It was awesome. I didn't even think to bring it to the meeting. I wish I, had, I, wish I would have, but I didn't. But one of the investors bought it at the airport. During the meeting, he throws it to Arnold. Yo, this is Corey right here. He stops the meeting. He's like, this is cool. Thinking, yeah, my idol's looking at me on the cover of a magazine now. This is crazy, right? Starts looking through it, and here's where the authenticity part really helps, guys. He gets to this, I got like a 10-page situation in here, and it's in my gym at the time, old school. He says, where's this gym at? So it's in Columbus, Ohio, where you have the Arnold Classic. is a big fitness event there. It's like, but it's mimic after the 70s. It's like, all right, so now I'm in shape. I'm a family. I got the authenticity part. And then, probably one of the more mind-blowing was, he goes like this, this is my pull-out ab poster. And he's, oh yeah, you know, we used to train with this guy, Frank Zane, your abs kind of look like his, which is like my all-time idol of bodybuilding because he kind of looked like me. So my brain is melting in this moment. But you know what I knew? Every one of those early mornings, this diet phase was super fucking difficult. It was all paying off for that moment, that's when the lights were shining, guys. But I didn't know when I was doing this that that was even gonna be a possibility. And I didn't even bring it. I got lucky. But I gave myself a chance. When I left, we had like a pitch book. He signed the front of it. I still have it at my house. I was like, I can't come out of here and not have this man be my business partner. This is the best opportunity of my life. I, from now on, stand by Arnold. I got the governor's ring. I got him to be my mentor. We did business together. It was unbelievable. But if all of that, like, you guys hear how serious I am. If I'm not that serious, that ain't happening to me. I can tell you that straight up. Uh, next story. So, how did I find an island? I was on Zillow one day, legitly, looking for property, and I saw this island. And two weeks and two days, I owned it after I got to it. My friend Brian Peters, who actually was the uh, captain for special teams for the Texans when J.J. Watt and those guys were there, and Deshaun when he actually made some passes, um, him and Jake took me to the took me to the island. So for, this is how it worked. Day one, I find it on Zillow, and I just drive out there because it's it's in front of another bigger island. So you, but I can't get there by car, but I could see it. I was like, man, this just looks like a bunch of trees, like acre, whatever. Day two. Brian's in the gym because he don't really have a schedule. He's like, uh, he's got his own business. He does like, actually coaches have him come down here for breathing. He's amazing. Does a whole thing with that. And he, uh, he's like, yo, my grandparents have a boat at the lake. I'll take you over there. So him and Jake, they take me around it. I don't really feel anything. Third day, I have my state farm agent take me out there. I swim over and I stand on it. Now I walk right through this area with these huge trees. And this is the part that's key to being locked in, guys. Like my intuition is maybe one of the best ever because I'm so in it every day with the discipline, with the habits. Like I can feel when it's right and when it's not right. And you can deny it. It's like the gut feeling people. But like this thing was a monster to try to handle. I walked in this canopy and everything told me I've got to try this with everything I got to pull this off 
unless I can't physically do it or financially do it. And it's a stretch because it's a serious fucking situation. And so this was 15 months ago, all right? Now we're gonna hit you a video that was up to about a month ago and then I'll show you what I just had happen uh, the other night. So, so here's where it looked, day one, clearing shit, they were getting a little bit thinner. I hooked up with this box hop company that built this super shit, uh, six sh container house that like has like a half a million followers, got a big following. We got it also in, in 452 days, we got it to that. Then in a two week period, you got the other one, we just had our launch event where Morgan Wade, who's an up and coming country music star, sung some songs and we got this. So this was last week. I had a barge parked out front. Everybody had to go across because we're still kind of doing construction. We had about 150 people out, food, DJ, Morgan played music, all of our customers that came around from all over the place. That's actually Brian that took me to the, took me to the island. And then we had the whole thing lit up at night. It was crazy. There's Morgan. Cole giving me a shout out. <laughs> and so in 15 months, that even, it looked like that in my head, not quite like that, but just the push and all the stuff I talked about, all the stuff that's in that book was what I le leaned on to be able to accomplish that. Is that it? Yeah, if you guys want to check out any of the stuff we do, we have the Max Effort Muscle, which you guys will yeah, try some of the supplements. You can go to MaxEffortMuscle.com. This is my app. Actually, Pat McAfee just shouted me out the other day for doing the lunges. So we've got tons of transformations. Like I said, we've helped thousands and thousands of people. There is some off-season stuff, too, on there if you guys want to check it out. But those are the two businesses that we're building right now, the Corey G Fitness app and the Max Effort Muscle, which you guys are going to get a chance. And Coach was nice enough to get some supplements for you guys. I think that's it. Holler at your boy. Enjoy the book. Appreciate y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, he mentioned we're gonna, we bought some of the supplements for you guys. So some protein, some creatine, and hydration stuff. Uh, so that'll all be set up in here tomorrow. We're getting it this evening. We'll have it all set up, ready to roll tomorrow for you guys. Got you guys max effort, Marshall baseball t-shirts too, yeah. which will be sick. I want to make sure if anybody's got any questions, yeah, I can answer some coaches. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Please. Yes. Are you going to put a gym on your own? I am. Yeah, so the, the, the garage doors, like, so yeah, the garage doors is the gym uh, that we showed like on the picture or whatever. It's off to the right side. And then I'm going to do an outdoor portion too. Yeah, so we'll have like, so this part right here is the gym. So you open it up to the water, you got a deck right there, and then I'm gonna lay a pad right here for the outdoor portion, and then on the backside we're gonna have a basketball hoop. Cause I still like, my youngest boy is in eighth grade and my oldest is a sophomore. We're like, we have an eight foot rim like jam court at our office, that's like what we do. So it's like we'll be hooping and lifting and that'll be, yeah, part of the lifestyle. And then also like a lot of the people that were here were friends and family, a lot of more customers. We just started a, a whole new business where if people get supplements on subscription, they can come to in-person events. So this was one of the in-person events. They came to the gym from nine to 12, and then we had a party on Muscle Island from like five to 10. It was like super cool. So, so yes, if you call it Muscle Island, you gotta have a gym. <laughs> Anybody else? Please ask now, anything. Don't be scared. You look like you got something, you got a great mullet. Yeah, thank you. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Taking creatine, is it necessary to load it for a couple days or should you just go with the five grams a day? So I'm more of like a 10 gram a day guy. Okay. So I've had a couple, uh, I have a baseball kid I work with assigned to go to Eastern Michigan and another one in the right state. And I had those guys 10 grams a day that were both trying to get bigger. So I think that's like a good staple for you guys, especially for the amount of supplements you guys will have is like for like a six week period of time. Hopefully we'll do another deal and I can come back down again. But that I would I would go ten <laughs> I'd go ten G a day, for sure. It just makes sure you drink enough water. Anybody else? Anything? Come on, go ahead. 
do you just do you just do like strength training or do you do bodybuilding stuff as well? Yeah, so that's the cool thing about how we train. We've always done a combo. So there's always been like a, a conjugate max, which is like a Russian tech, like kind of old school mentality where you take like a different variation of a squat or deadlift or a heavy press. And then we would do like bodybuilding accessories after. And then one of the things I got pretty popular for is I squatted every day super heavy for like three years. Um, different front squats and bands and all kinds of shit that went on the internet and did really well. And then I was lunging a half mile uh, every day after that. That was like my baseline. Me lunging a half mile for 500 days in a row or whatever was like me just walking down the hallway, like no big deal. But that's where like some of my mentality, especially being drug free, so the supplement game and understanding diet and nutrition to, to be able to recover from things like that. I didn't even start squatting every day until I was like 36. So it's not like I was doing it when I was 20. You know what I mean? So I've been able to kind of out uh, with the diet and nutrition and stuff that I practice, I've been able to, you know, keep my career. Uh, uh, there's like a longevity piece to it now. Anything else? Good. I can't grow my upper chest. What should I do? Your incline, your incline form is probably all fucked up. So, so this is, this is great though, because a lot of people ask me questions. They never follow up. Send me a video of it on Instagram. Yo, I'm the dude with the great mullet in the back. Here's my incline form. I probably could fix it and probably change that for you. Uh, how far is the island from your house? Uh, so great question. 30 minutes with the boat ride. So 20 minute drive from the gym facility. And then it's a five, it's like a five or 10 minute boat ride from the marina. So it's very close. So I can feel like I can be in a different area and mindset like that. One of my um, kind of things I want to do is do more of this, more of the books, more speaking. And I think that a place like that's something where I can do a lot of that type of stuff, like writing and content and that type of stuff. Yeah. So what had you on Zillow that day looking for an island? Yeah, so I wasn't looking for an island. That's the key. I was looking for just a, um, I, I have a few properties. I'm not like a big real estate guy, but I got a few things. And I was just looking for a fixer upper on the lake. Cause I was like, yeah, I never really, I've never even driven a boat before. I literally bought that. Walked into the marina and was like, all right, I need help. I don't know how to drive a boat, park a boat. I didn't even think I'd be owning a boat two weeks from now. I bought like a, like a beat up work boat that I needed for like all the contractors and stuff. And when I saw the island, I thought it was like, so Dave Thomas, the old founder of Wendy's, owns, owned an island on this lake and the Dispatch family, which is the big um, like newspaper in Columbus. So I knew they were there, but I didn't know there was any available. And so I'm looking at the first thing I told you guys, the one, I'm looking at a legacy piece. I'm now the bodybuilder that bought the island, like up there to all these old people or whatever. And like Muscle Island now could be part of my legacy for my kids and my family. I'm never planning on selling it. Like it'll just be passed down and used for, you know, events and memories and things like that. Or maybe team events. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> question go ahead coach like, and to train like you train and to do the things you do you kind of move into a different headspace right mm -hmm. like you gotta go to you saw it you go to the place <laughs> yeah right? yep how, like how do you get there because i think our guy like we need to all at this age learn sure how to focus how to stay tight how to eliminate <laughs> shit and noise and and keep us there how so, do we go to that place i think uh relying on the daily schedule is why i'm here 100 percent. like i don't have like a um process of like whether i'm gonna go or not or whether i'm gonna give it what i got that day like there's it's a non-negotiable and so now i'm not like that every day in the gym but there's days where that's required and it's the same with you guys too right like not just going through the motions, you're giving it what you got. Then there's some days where it's like, it's just different. Now that's a competition day. So that would be like a game day for you guys, which is a little different. But the reality is it's the non-negotiables. Like people, uh, I've been doing this for a long time, but people thought like 4 a.m. is like a flex. 4 a.m. is like a necessity. I have three kids. I have multiple businesses. I'm still competing. If I'm not at 4 a.m., my phone's ringing and I'm running multiple seven-figure situations like, I gotta not just be Corey the trainer, I gotta be Corey the business guy and the dad too. So the reality is it ended up at that time because that's the only time I got. It's, it's uninterrupted. Once again, what I say, distractions and all that shit, right? That ain't happening. When I'm at the gym, I'm just Corey that lifts weights and I'm intense and I'm competitive and it's a team and it's camaraderie, it's the locker room, it's all the same thing you guys got. I just still have it at this age too. 
which is I'm thankful of. But the reality is if it didn't happen at that time, my phone starts ringing at seven, my wife needs something, my kids need something, what kind of workout am I getting? No, because they're a priority too, right? So that happened purely because of that. So I would argue if you're not getting what you need, go to bed a little earlier, get up a little earlier. See what happens. See what happens when that's the new expectation. I know, I know what happens, I live it every day. Every day. And people are like, gee, you made enough money, you're doing this now, why are you still getting up? I know what it yields. That's it. I know what I get for it. So I don't mind putting the time in. I've been doing this for a long time, so I, I know that this world works by a certain set of rules. If you follow them and you have faith, it's uh, to believe the things you can see and touch is no belief at all, but to believe in the unseen is a triumph and a blessing. I make the unseen seen. That's why it's tattooed right here on my arm. That's an Abraham Lincoln quote. And also there's another quote that Cole put up on his Instagram yesterday about you can't tell whether we're working or we're playing. There's no distinction. A lot of people don't even really understand all the way what I do sometimes because it's confusing because they see what we're doing and they wonder like, how the fuck do we make money at that? It's, we just figured it out. So those are two components that I try to keep ever present. Really important. Anything else? Good. Good? <laughs> I'll send them to you. I'll send them to you, Greg. So yeah, so I had a little bit of a back issue, so I kind of laid off of them because my thing was, because I wasn't really that gifted of an athlete, I needed my abs to look like crazy, right? I used to think like, you guys will laugh at this, I wanted my abs to look so crazy, you got uncomfortable when you saw them. Like, I'd, they'd be brick showed and they'd be like, oh fuck, like, so I would do 100 ab wheels every morning and every evening, and then weighted straight legs, about 100, and then before I go to bed, I would take a 25 pounder behind my uh, head and do like 200 uh, crunches. And so every time I was getting ready for all the magazines and stuff, that's what I was doing. Yeah, it was my routine. For The problem is though, because I'm not an athlete, right, like you guys, I made my abs way stronger than my lower back. So it was good for what I was doing, but I've kind of like laid off of it a little bit as I got older just because they're already built now. And it's like, if I'm lean enough, we're good. So yeah, good question though. Good. Uh, between nine and 10. So here's the other thing is, a lot of people have rivaled me on this, so I wore the little whoop thing for a little while. And because of the diet and nutrition, I don't think I was doing this on purpose, but it, it kind of hacked that process a little bit for me. So my sleep quality was the worst it ever was when I wore that thing for like three or four months was 92%, and that was the days I drank alcohol because I still drink some bourbon and whatever and Guinness and stuff. But when I don't drink, it was 97 to 99 and my REM sleep was way higher than most people that sleep eight hours. So I would argue with people all the time, okay, you're sleeping eight, but are you really sleeping eight? I'm sleeping five, but is my five superior to your eight? That's debatable, but I've also been competing and doing this for a really long time. I don't eat anything that raises my insulin during the day. I, I keep that for nighttime. I give myself a little natural insulin spike. It dives me down right as I go to sleep. That's when your hormones are the highest. That's when your recovery is there. If you're about your game the whole day, which I am, I get a quality sleep. And so I think I've been able to do this process for a really long time because I am actually rested. Now, I used to have this kind of crazy rant on the internet, I don't get tired. I don't get tired because my purpose is to change generations of my family. And I think I've clearly done that, but it doesn't feel, because that's just part of the sickness, right? You gotta keep pushing. But the reality is, is that I've been able to do these other things relentlessly because I've taken care of this part like really well for a long time. So that's how I do it. Good. Uh, usually some type of fruit and some type of fat. So like bananas, peanut butter, uh, coconut oil, blueberry, just some type of like healthy sugar and some type of, um, some type of quality fat. Now on the weekends, like ice cream, bourbon, yeah, <laughs> still spiking it just a little bit dirtier. <laughs> That's one the other thing is, guys, I'm like a real dude. Like, I'm fucking crazy, but like, I also like shut it down early on Friday. I'm at the bar with my wife. Like, I'm, I'm trying to like be as normal as that can be for how crazy I am. Like, I am trying to have like a lifestyle. I'm not just a robot constantly. Like, I like to get after it too. Go ahead. What's your overall like your daily diet? Yeah, so I eat pretty much the same thing. I eat uh, like a quality beef, a sweet potato, avocado. That's my main meals. And then I use the plant protein from us or the whey protein um, that you guys are getting. Super basic. I just eat quality meat, quality carb, quality fat. Good? That was my question. Yeah, that was your question? Uh, yeah, I was going to see like what. Sweet potatoes are like the, um, 
Like I didn't like them when I first started or whatever. I ate them at one of my friend's reunions that had a bunch of marshmallows on them. They taste amazing, but I knew that wasn't the one I was probably able to eat on a regular basis. Is that me? No. But the reality is, come on, coach. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm just messing with you. So um, that's, that's what I've stayed. I've stayed with all these years. Beef for me has always been the best. Um, I haven't had tested, but my, my sister is like allergic, uh, mildly allergic to chicken. So I've never felt that good when I ate chicken back in the day and never looked the right way. So I think I had an allergy to it and didn't know it. But I've settled on beef, sweet potato, avocado. Do you think it matters how lean it is? Um, I usually go like no worse than like the 85-15 or 90-10 or I eat steaks most of the time now. We have a meal prep service up there so I've got like um, like a beef bowl, I eat a couple of those and then add a sweet, I cook sweet potatoes for the whole week, buy avocados, I have the meal prep service so I have like you know 15 meals, I, I don't really have to prep that much. I'm kind of, a, so here's what it is, same with as, as an athlete. The food for the week, especially in season, it's for fuel. I'm not like caught up in like like in that. Then when I'm getting after it, it's wings and stuff I want to eat, but that's like 10% of the time. So I'm giving you 90% of what my body should have and 10% of degeneracy basically. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> go ahead. Grass fed beef? Oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I don't really trip on that. I usually buy it from a, like a low, like I actually trade one of my athletes, he owns a beef farm. I get a half a cow and he trains with me for the whole year. Pretty cool. That's a great deal. I know. Amazing deal. Cash Reeves. Yeah, amazing deal. He's a baseball kid. Loves it. Just pulled a, a 405 off one mat as a sophomore weighing buck 50 something. He's just eating beef, deadlifting. It's awesome. Thoughts on the carnivore diet? Um, carnivore diets are really good, but very hard to sustain long term, I think. So I think it's a good practice to get your weight down. Definitely wouldn't recommend it for an athlete, um, but I think, it, I think it has its place for sure. The best diet is the one that you feel the best on you'll actually follow. You know what I mean? Good. Um, how often do you work out? Uh, every, I do something every day. Yeah, so I lift uh, weights relatively heavy Monday through Friday, then mostly just conditioning, body weight type stuff on the weekends. So I just think like I have to lift something and usually do some type of conditioning most days. If on the weekend I sleep in, which is like 6.30 or something, I'll still get up, walk an hour. I know, yeah. I walk an hour on the treadmill, but it's three hours difference for me. I feels like I'm sleeping in. <laughs> I'll walk an hour on the treadmill or go lunge or, or hoop or something. But I try to stay out. It, it really is if you don't use it, you lose it, truly, especially as we, I get older. Um, I feel younger the more active I stay. So I just, like, get up and be like, what else am I going to do? Like, I just love – I love it. It's like you guys playing ball. Like, I just – it's the same for me. How long did it take you to get used to waking up so early? Uh, you know, it's funny as my mom was at the island event, she was telling stories to some of the customers. She used to come in my trailer room and be like, Corey, get out of bed. And this would be like, you know, for school or whatever. I wouldn't do anything. Second was she'd flip on the light. Third, she'd spray me in the face with a water bottle. Like that was her vibe of getting me up, right? She's a single mom. So she was like, just trying to find a way to get me out. And so I remember working in the coal mine and telling my stepdad, cause we had to be there at five. I was like, when I get my regular job, there ain't no way in hell I'm getting up this early. And he was not retired yet when I was at home a few times. And I was up training before he was even at work. He was like, remember what your ass said to me? Like, blah, 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 you know? Um, we started at 5 o'clock. I think it was probably about 15 years ago, maybe a little bit longer. And then when he switched it to 4, it was different. Because I have guys that don't do this for their living, but they compete. They drive from all over the, the city. Some of them up to 45 minutes or an hour. One guy now an hour and a half to come to the gym to train with us once a week. Because it's that type of vibe. And... I don't know, man, just I got addicted to the of what was happening at that time frame and addicted to what I was getting back in return. And so, yeah, it didn't take me super long. I think I just evolved over time once again because of the necessity start having kids and stuff. And it's just what it is. So I wouldn't just jump to that, though. I think you make it. That's where people go. I get up at seven. G said get up at 320. That's going to like mess your world up. But why not 630? And then you're like, well, you know, I want to get a little extra reading and do this at six. Uh, maybe I want to do a little extra of this. It's five. See, I would just creep it over time. That's the best way.